Welcome to the CBS Radio Mystery Theater Archives. The only YouTube channel which has the original classic episodes of the CBS Radio Mystery Theater in order with no ads. Thank you for listening. And now, enjoy the show. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. How are you? Happy? Depressed? Something in between? Well, whatever your mood, listen to a story of success. What does a man want? Wealth? Fame? The love of women? Well, let's be honest. He wants all these things. Wants them. Dreams of them. Lusts after them. For these three things, he will fight to the death. Or be killed in battle. Well, you know what Mr. Mom said. No. What did Mr. Mom say? Not Mon. Mom. Mr. Somerset Mom. Good grief. Don't you know anything? I know a lot. Now tell me. What did he say? He said money is a sixth sense without which one cannot make proper use of the other five. <laughs> drama, Help Somebody, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars William Redfield. It is sponsored in part by the Florida Orange Growers and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. concerns a writer, and his name is Anthony Price. Nobody's much interested in writers. People are apt to think that plays are ad-lib by the actors, that movies are improvised by the director, that novels tell their own stories, that poems form themselves. But in the words of an old theatrical maxim, if it ain't on the page, it ain't on the stage. And it's not in the book either. Or on the printed page, or, I might add, on the radio. So listen now to the story of Anthony Price, writer. It was incredible, absolutely incredible, and I, more than anyone, couldn't believe it. But before I try to tell you about it, let me go back a little and hope that will explain, at least in part, why I could not comprehend what came later. It began in Italy, in Rome. Pronto? Si. Anthony Price, aqui. Anthony? Si, yes. Clark McKay, Anthony, your father's lawyer. You remember me? Oh, very well, Mr. McKay. How's every little thing in New York? Anthony, uh, your father asked me to call you. Oh? Couldn't he have picked up the phone himself? Anthony, he asked me to tell you the answer is no. Look, hasn't he heard there's inflation in Italy, too? That pitiful allowance he granted me ten years ago is positively pathetic by now. Well, he thinks you should be able to supplement it with your writing. Mr. McKay, I've written four books and made a grand total of $914. Uh, perhaps you should try something else. I don't know anything else. Well, there must be something. There isn't. Thanks for calling, Mr. McKay. I was living in Rome in the thieves' quarter, though no accomplished thief would have deigned to live there, in a room smaller than Savonarola's cell, eating pasta and frutta and more pasta than frutta, obstinately trying to earn the right to call myself a novelist. 
pronto. See Anthony Price. Uh, yes, yes, hello. Tony, you there, Tony? Can you hear me? I'm here, I hear you. This is Leon, Tony. I got your manuscript. I read part of it. It's not bad so far. Oh, I love your wild enthusiasm. I'll call you again when I finished it. Well, don't throw your money around, Leon. Send it over here. Of course, a couple of other editors will have to see it. Why did you bother to call, Leon? Listen, uh, they may like it a lot. How do I know? You don't. So, uh, cheer up. So long, Leon. Tony, I... Each day when I finished writing, I walked to the piazza for coffee and the feeling of people around me. A film company was shooting a picture there, and a young actress named Claudia Crisi had a minor role. I was attracted to her from the start, and then finally filled to the brim with a desire to go to bed with her. Pronto. Antonio, it's Claudia. How are you? All right. What about tonight? Oh, I can't. That's why I'm calling you. Hmm. You couldn't last night either. Tomorrow night is it possible. Oh, Claudia, you're driving me crazy. Oh, they're shooting a new scene for the picture. All the different words. I have to learn the new ones. And I have to talk to the director about the changes. Hmm, I see. Oh, boy, do I see. Now, Antonio... Thanks for making everything so Antonio. clear. Antonio... I was 33 years old and succeeding at nothing but growing older. Then the cablegram arrived. Your father gravely ill, come at once. Sufficient money for the plane fare accompanied the cable. I thought wildly of pocketing the money and staying rooted in Rome, but some puritanical shred still clung to my conscience. And two hours later, I was on the plane, bound for the metropolis I had not seen for ten years. Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, yes, uh, who... Uh... I was... <laughs> I wasn't sure I recognized you. You are Anthony Price, aren't you? Yes, I... Oh, are you... Oh, you're Clark McKay, right? Right. Well, it's very nice of you to meet the plane. I didn't expect it. Well, uh... <clears throat> under the circumstances, uh... Come on, let's get your luggage. Oh, I've got my luggage. Right here. Uh, just that one small bag? That's all. Oh. Well, then, let's get a cab. I uh, think I should tell you, of course you probably know anyway, I don't have money for a decent hotel. Oh, that's all right. Well, no, it isn't all right, but any place will do. How is my father? Uh, you can stay in his apartment if you like. I'm not sure he'd like. It's very large, 13-room penthouse overlooking the park. Your father bought it last year. Mm, I suppose he's in a hospital. Which one? He's not in a hospital, no. Oh, then he must be better. Anthony, he's dead. He's dead? Yes, about an hour ago. I was 30,000 feet in the air an hour ago. I'm sorry. I wish I were. Uh, Mr. McKay, we weren't on the best of terms. You know that. I, but I wish I could feel something. It's, it's terrible not to feel anything at all. Well, it's the shock. Maybe... Well, now, uh, perhaps I can give you some news that will... Uh, that penthouse I was telling you about. Yes, uh, 13 rooms overlooking the park. Yes, he left it to you, Anthony. He what? It's in your name. <laughs> but the, that's a riot. Oh, that's the funniest thing I ever heard. How am I supposed to support a penthouse when I can't even support myself? Uh, yes, well, uh, of course, there'll be a formal reading of the will, but... Uh, I see no reason not to tell you, since you're, uh, Anthony, you are the sole heir. I'm what? He left all his money to you. To me? All of it? It's over a million dollars. A million? Well, it's closer to two. And he... he left it all to me? All of it. What's the catch? There's no catch. He simply left me the money? That's right. Oh, I can't get over it. Now, uh, I'm the executor. I can't turn it over to you till the will goes through probate, but... I'm rich. I'm rich. How do you like that? I'm actually rich. Yes, you are. I never thought... I never dreamed... 
Well, all, all, all right. Now, we'll, uh, well, what's the best hotel in town? I want to go there. Take it easy. Look, Mr. McKay, when I left Rome, I gave them your address and phone number just in case. I, you see, I didn't know where I'd be staying. Now, if anybody calls, will you tell them where I am? Yes, of course. Now, let's go to some elegant hotel. I mean, the best. I proceeded to go crazy. Room service. Even when I wasn't hungry or thirsty, I called room service. I bought clothes and charged them to this person named Anthony Price, whom I scarcely knew. I bought a watch and a pair of solid gold cufflinks before I had shirts they'd even go into. I walked through the 13 rooms of the penthouse overlooking the park and then called a decorator and told him what I wanted. Lots of space, empty corners, soft things to sit and lie on, plenty of white and lots of yellow and a few touches of red. It was in the middle of one of these prodigious conferences when the phone rang. Hello, hello. This is Leon, Tony. Oh, how are you, Leon? You haven't forgotten your book's gone to press, have you? Huh? When? When did you decide that? Well, we pushed the publication date up a bit. I told you that. Oh, I must have forgotten. It's not in the bookstores yet, but the review should be coming out in a day or so. Hmm. The most I've ever gotten before was three inches in the back of the Sunday book section. Three lukewarm inches, I might add. I just thought I'd tell you. Thanks a lot, but don't hold your breath. So long, Leon. So long. <laughs> you may think I sounded blasé, and I suppose I did, but in the pit of my stomach, there was the old familiar stirring, the bubble of excitement, the fervid silent prayer, this time, this time, let them like what I've written. I stayed up every night waiting for the morning editions to hit the stands, and finally, shortly after midnight, I don't, I don't, I don't believe it, I, I don't, I'm a success. Hey, hey, everybody, I'm famous, it's happened, I'm a success! I was in Leon's office before nine o'clock, clutching the morning papers and waiting for him. My heart was racing, my head was spinning. Congratulations, Tony. Ah, ah, you've seen him? The important ones. Come on inside. And you thought the book was no good. I never said that. Well, you never called it the authentic masterpiece of the decade. I never thought it was. Al, what do you think now? I think a lot of other people think it's the masterpiece of the decade. Mm Mm-hmm. And for all I know, they're right. Oh, Lord, Lord, it's all too much. It's too much. I can't take it in. I really can't. First the money, now this. Pretty overwhelming, isn't it? Overwhelming, devastating. There's, there's, there's no word to describe it. It's too much, Leon. Do you mind if I answer this? I don't mind anything. Go ahead. Yes? Is Mr. Anthony Price there by any chance? He's right here in my office. I couldn't reach him at his home. Uh, may I speak with him, please? This is his lawyer. Certainly. It's uh, your lawyer. Oh, Uh, yes, Mr. McKay. Anthony, I have a cablegram here for you. Shall I send it over, or do you want to pick it up? Read it to me. You sure? Sure, I'm sure. Um, it's from Rome. It's signed, Claudia. Read it. I cannot live without you, Antonio. Arriving tomorrow, flight number... That's enough. Well, don't you want to know the... Uh, I'll pick it up in a little while. She cannot live without me. Who? She's flying here to be with me. Who is? A girl I've been wanting for months and months, and now she wants me. It's too much. It's just... It's just too much. How very far our hero has advanced in the short time we've been on the air. How short a time in his young life. From the slums of Rome, from artistic obscurity, from the frustration of unrequited desire to riches, fame, and love. Where, oh, where can he go from here? We'll let you know in Act Two. of Anthony Price died suddenly and left his son almost two million dollars. 
and a penthouse overlooking the park. Following close upon this stupendous event came the publication of Anthony's fifth novel and the reviews which made it his first successful one. And Fortune's smile turned to a gurgle of lighthearted laughter when he received a telegram from the girl he coveted, announcing that she felt the same desire for him and was flying to join him. Antonio! Antonio! Oh, my darling! Oh, let me look at you. Oh, I wasn't wrong. You are the most beautiful thing in the world. Come on, come on. I've got a car waiting. Oh, but my, my, my suitcase... Never mind. I'll send somebody back for them. Uh, just uh, give me the check stuff. <laughs> What's all this? This car waiting, this sending somebody back for the suitcases. <laughs> you talk like a rich man. I am. My father left me all his money. Your father, who was so stingy? Well, he got generous toward the end. He also left me a 13-room penthouse. A penthouse? With a terrace. Overlook Central Park. I've had it all done over. I thought that we'd be staying in some cheap pensione. Oh, oh, I can't wait to see it. Well, you'll have to wait for a couple of hours. Oh, I can't. Now, I have to go to a cocktail party, and you have to come with me. I don't care about any old cocktail party. I only care about this one. It's for me. For you? My publishers are throwing it. My book came out a couple of days ago, and Claudia, it's a hit. Not just a hit, a big, big hit. Antonio, you're a success. You're famous. How oh, wonderful. And you're beautiful. <laughs> Lord, but you're beautiful. And how I want you. <laughs> This is so exciting. Is it? <laughs> Who are all of these people? I don't know. Publishers, editors, writers. I don't know any of them. Then how am I going to meet anybody? Well, why don't you just go mingle with the crowd? The way you look, you'll meet everybody inside half an hour. This isn't the movie crowd. Oh, come on. You just can't stand in the corner. Yes, I can. Oh, you look as though you hadn't even been invited. Mm, that's how I feel. Well... If that's the way you're going to behave, Antonio, we might as well leave. Let's. Only I don't want to. Oh, wait a second, wait a second. There's my editor. Uh, Leon. Oh, you see, you do know somebody. <laughs> yes. Over here, Leon. Oh, well, oh, finally. Uh, how long have you been here? <laughs> Forever. Uh, not long. Uh, Claudia, this is Leon Long, my editor. Signorina Claudia Creasy, actress. <laughs> Signorina... In uh, Chante, or whatever you say in Italian. Uh -huh. <laughs> Mr. Lana, oh, I've heard about you so much. You mean that? Uh, Leon, do me a favor. Take Claudia, introduce her around, will you? She wants to meet people. Well, sure, but what about you? You're supposed to meet people. This is your part. Oh, later, later I will, I promise. I, I don't know. I'm just not used to this kind of thing. Signorina uh, Crisi, permesso. How's that for speaking the language? Oh, perfetto. And, and uh, uh, call me Claudia, oh, please. Uh, Claudia. <laughs> I stood there like a wallflower. I can't tell you why. This great gathering of people all there to meet the man who had written the authentic masterpiece of the decade. Ten years of trying to reach the very spot where I now stood, and I couldn't take the next step. Anthony? Anthony. What? Oh, oh, Mr. McKay. <laughs> Hello. I, I didn't know you'd be here. I asked your publishers to invite me. <laughs> they were kind enough. Well, I, I'm glad you're here. Uh, shouldn't you be out there in the middle of the crowd receiving plaudits? Yes, I guess I should. Well, then? Oh, I will later. Uh, yes. <clears throat> Anthony, we're, uh, what do you plan to do with your money? I, I think we ought to begin to think about that, don't you? But what do you mean, do with it? Well, there are various ways of handling it. Well, what did my father do with it? I'll do whatever he did, I guess. Well, your father used it to make more money. Oh, I see. Well, no, no, I don't think I'd care to do that. Actually, I wouldn't know how. I mean, can't we just put it in the bank and I... Well, I'll buy things with it, I guess. Uh-huh. A car? Oh, I already bought one of those. Oh, what kind? Maserati. Oh, that's a good car. Yes. I wanted one for ten years. Now I've got one. <laughs> you like it? What? I said, do you like it? Oh, look. Look at Claudia. She's having a ball, isn't she? Um, which...
which is Claudia? The most beautiful girl in the room. Oh, she's the one from Italy. Sent you the cable. Mm Mm-hmm. Leon's introducing her around. Well, I think he's bringing her back here. Antonio, oh, oh, such a beautiful party. I meet so many people. Everybody's so nice. Come on, Tony, you can't stand against that wall any longer. Go on, darling. It's a your party, all for you. You really should, Anthony. I don't want to. Tony, come on. Antonio. Oh, I, I really think, Anthony. I you... want to get out of here. You can. Claudia, come on. We're leaving now. I have to get my coat. Well, then we'll get it. I started to move away with her, but I stopped before I'd gone very far. The voices of Leon and McKay reached me where I stood. Is he all right, do you think? I don't know. I was talking to him before about his inheritance. He didn't seem interested. Well, he certainly isn't interested in anything here. I think, uh, I think perhaps all he's interested in is the young girl from Italy. That must be it. That must be it. I said the words over to myself. That must be it. Claudia was here. Claudia was with me. She had flown the ocean to be with me. I was waiting for her to collect her coat. Then she and I would get into my Maserati. We would drive to my 13-room penthouse. And there, there after all the months of longing and frustration, she would be mine. Here we are. Yes. Oh, Antonio. Oh, Dio mio, magnifico. Oh, que bello, que bello. Ah, you like it, huh? Oh, never have I seen. Oh, how lucky you are, Antonio. Oh, exquisito. And so gay, so light, so italiano. You think so? You don't like it? I don't know. Why don't you like it? It looks gray. Gray? With the white walls, the yellow shutters, the beautiful white carpet? Oh, what are you talking about? I don't know. I just think it looks gray. (gasps) And the beautiful red couch. Oh, is it velvet? I don't know what it is. Oh, and look down there. Antonio. Antonio, come to the window. Look. Oh, Oh, how beautiful. Look there. That's the park. Yes, I know it's the park. Look. You can see the people with the dogs. Mm -hmm. Hundreds of people. Hundreds of dogs. Ah, how sweet. Come, I want to show you the bedroom. Uh, One of the bedrooms. Your bedroom? Yes. It's mine. It's hard to remember that it's mine, but... Well, it is. There. Oh, beautiful. Some difference from that little room in the thieves' quarter, no? Mm-hmm. It's different, all right. Antonio, kiss me. Don't you want to? I want to very much. Oh, wait. Right here. I want to bathe, and then... Wait, right there. I stretched out on the bed and thought of her taking off her clothes, running the water in the tub, pouring in the bath oil, picking up the scented soap, washing her beautiful body. I I ached with desire. It was going to happen to me. This, surely this, was what I had waited for. Well? Oh, come here. Of course. I've wanted you for such a long time. Let's not wait any longer, Antonio. The moment is now. Yes. Now. What is a man supposed to feel when he first possesses a woman he has desired? Triumph? Ecstasy? Fulfillment? I don't really know. All I know is that I felt nothing. I could have been an actor in a motion picture. I could have been reading about myself. This man, this Anthony Price, this this character, this this hero. Oh, what a man. 
rich, famous, and beloved. I, I marveled at him, and I... And I felt nothing. Antonio, say something, please. You don't like me? I, I, I disappoint you? It was very good. Then why... Antonio, look at me. Oh, Dio mio, you look so sad. I never saw a man who looked so sad. What is it? Is it me? Did I do wrong? You did everything right. Then why do you look so unhappy? I don't know. Oh, I was not good for you. Oh, no, no. No, it's not that. I... Please, I don't want you to think that. Well, what else can I think? You're beautiful. You're desirable. Everything was exactly what I wanted. I, I'm a lucky man. Then why are you so unhappy? Because you are unhappy, aren't you? I feel... It's not even unhappiness. It, it's worse. What can be worse? Ashes. Ashes in my mouth. What does that mean? Everything has turned to ashes. Oh, if you're going to talk like that, I, I don't understand a word. I know, I know, and I can't make you understand. I, Claudia, look, do one more thing for me, will you? Anything. What? Go back to Italy. Now? Right now. I'll give you the money. I have my own money, thank you. No, no, no. I want to give you some, Cara. I have a lot. I don't want any of your money. Please, let me, Claudia. I'm going to get dressed now. Find out when the next plane leaves for Rome. I called the airline. Then I walked to the window and I looked down at the park. There were the people, walking their assortment of dogs, pausing to talk to one another... All very urban, very civilized, very nice. Then I saw a black figure racing along the furthest edge of the park, running wild and unattended. I wanted, above all else, I wanted to be that solitary thing. I wanted to be a wolf, a lone wolf on the tundra so that I could open up my throat and howl. A desperate, abandoned howl filled with terror and desperation. A howl that would say, I am here. I am frightened. I am alone. And I don't know what to do. Consider the predicament of the tiny baby whose mother has turned off the light left the room and shut the door, leaving the helpless infant not knowing that she will ever come back. What can the child do but cry? And what does the cry say but, I am here, I am frightened, I am alone, and I don't know what to do. Now, what of the grown man for whom every aspiration, once achieved, yields no satisfaction? What of him? We'll explore his destiny when we return shortly with Act Three. WBBM, Chicago. We left Anthony Price, writer, with his new wealth, his sudden fame, both turned to ashes in his mouth. His capacity to enjoy them evaporated. He had just suffered his bitterest disappointment. The girl of his dreams and desire had yielded herself to him, and this, too, had brought no pleasure. We rejoin him now, alone. I lived somehow through the days that followed. There was nothing I wanted to buy. There was no talk show or interview that I wanted to take part in. There was no woman I wanted to meet. For the most part, I lay on the red velvet couch and stared at the ceiling. Now and again, I would get up and walk to the window and stare down at the park with its myriad of people and dogs. One day, I thought I would dress, go outside, cross the street, and join them. Perhaps lose myself in that idle crowd of dog-walking people I did not know who did not know me. I developed a mild interest in the dog-walking people. They usually formed little groups, 
And when I eavesdropped on their conversations, I found they were almost always talking about their dogs, almost never about themselves. And another funny thing, they almost never knew one another's names, but they always knew the names of one another's dogs. So it was, hello, Beauregard, hi there, Colonel, well, how's Mingus today? Greetings like that. It was as though this brief, dutiful period in the park had been given over to the dogs and the pets had become the people, and the people, the pets. Then one day, I saw a young girl sitting on a bench, a stringy, scrawny sort of a girl, not distinctive in any way save one. She had no dog. Uh, hello. Hello. Mind if I sit down? No. Thank you. <laughs> I don't have a dog either. Makes me feel out of place here. So why don't you get a dog? Why don't you? Well, my landlady won't let me keep one. Oh. Anyway, I have one. Sort of. Where do you keep it? Well, he keeps himself. <laughs> really? Where? Well, I don't know. Oh. Uh, why do you say he's yours? Well, I feed him. I'm waiting for him now. I, I have some steak with me. I saved it from dinner last night. I was taken out to a restaurant. Are you sure he'll show up? Well, he always does. Oh. Um, what's his name? Oh, I haven't given him a name. It's not up to me. On the other hand, I suppose I ought to call him something. Well, that's a good name. What is? Something. You think so? Well, if I were a stray dog, I'd like to think someone was looking for me. And everybody's looking for something. Don't you think so? Is that supposed to be a joke? I don't think so. Well, oh, here he comes. That's him? He's just a mongrel, but he's very beautiful, don't, don't you think? I've seen him before. Oh, he comes around every day. No, no, not here. I saw him from my window once, uh, running, just the way he's running now. It was a day when I thought the world had ended. Oh, obviously, it didn't end. Not quite. Come on, good dog. Come on over here. Here's something. Oh, good dog. I saw the girl almost every day for the next few weeks. Once or twice, she wasn't on the familiar bench, and on those days, the dog didn't show up either. I never asked her anything about herself. True to what I took to be the code of the dog walkers, I confined our conversations to the subject of the black dog. Then, one bright sunny day, I walked with some semblance of a purposeful stride to the familiar bench and found it empty. I sat down and waited. I waited until nightfall. Oh, well, it had happened before. Tomorrow we would meet and talk about the black dog and bring our bags of food for him and discuss his weight and the color of his eyes. But she wasn't there the next day, or the day after, or the day after. And the black dog was nowhere around. Mind if I sit here? Not at all. Oh. Nice dogs you've got there. Um, poodles? Can't you tell? Hmm. Um, I'm looking for someone, a, a girl. She usually sits on this bench. She has this dog. I mean, he's not hers, but she feeds him. I mean, he, he's black, uh, long hair, very glossy, shiny hair, wavy tail, amber eyes. What's his name? His name. Well, she never gave him a name. <laughs> she said she supposed she ought to call him something, and I said, well, that's a good name, something, but we really never decided exactly. And then the dog doesn't belong to you. Oh, no, no. Then he's a feral dog. A what? A feral dog, wild, untamed. Oh, no, no, he's not wild. No, and he's very tame. He's a very, uh, he's a very nice dog. Feral dogs don't last long. They don't? I read somewhere two years is the average life for a feral dog. Never have I hated a man so much. I left without another word. By the time I got back to the apartment, I was trembling with rage. But what had he said to anger me so? 
two years is the average time for a feral dog. Though he'd read that somewhere, he'd simply repeated it to me, but in a voice and with a manner so... so indifferent, so callous, so uncaring, I... I wanted to kill him. I was in the park the next morning almost as soon as it was light. I reached the bench which had been my rendezvous for those few life-saving weeks. I didn't expect to find the girl there at that hour. I didn't expect to find anyone. But there was someone, a very old man, dogless like me. And I sat down beside him. Oh, nice morning. Oh, yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I very seldom come out this early. Well, probably you can sleep. Yeah, I'm pretty well, yes. I have trouble in that department. I'm 82 years old. You don't say. What brings you out so early? Well, actually, I couldn't sleep either. Something happened yesterday right here on this bench. As a matter of fact, something someone said. Oh? Yes, someone I didn't know, a complete stranger. He said, um, feral dogs only live two years on the average. Feral dogs. Dogs without homes. I don't know why that made me so angry, but uh, it did. Are you interested in feral dogs? Well, I'm interested in one, uh, a black one. Uh, there was a girl, you see. She used to feed him. And she and I got to talking one day. I told him the whole thing. The whole trivial story. He didn't seem bored. He seemed quite interested, even concerned. Well, I know that girl. You do? Oh, what happened to her? Uh, why doesn't she come around anymore? Well, she got married. She got married? Uh, I think they moved upstate somewhere. Uh, he got a job up there. Oh. <laughs> well, I don't know why I'm surprised. There's no reason in the world why she shouldn't get married, only... Well, I guess I got into the habit of meeting her and feeding the dog. <laughs> I guess I thought it would go on forever. <laughs> that was silly of me. You got to be a habit. Well, sort of. Uh, no, 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 it was more than that. You see, uh, I met her and... Through her, I met the dog at a kind of crucial time in my life. Mm -hmm. Something happened to me. Well, a lot of things happened to me uh, all at once when I least expected it. Uh, at least expected them, I mean, any of them. and Well, certainly not all of them. And then it happened, and that was the worst of all. I... I'm sorry. I, I, I must sound all mixed up. I must sound crazy. <laughs> That's all right. I I'll try to straighten it out. Uh, that is, if you're interested... Oh. I've got all day if it takes that long. Well, I, I don't think it'll... On the other hand, I don't know. It might. Well, it's a nice day. It all started when I was in Rome. And I got a cable that my father was very ill. By the time I got here, he was dead. It all came spilling out. He'd nod once in a while and say, oh, yes, or mm-hmm. Never anything more than that. And I went on and on. I'm not sure I was coherent all the time or any of the time, but I, I didn't care. I talked on and on. You see, these were all the things I'd wanted, things I'd craved, mm -hmm. things I thought would make my life happy and complete and, and, and everything like that. And here I had them. And not just had them, but the promise of more to come. More money, more books, you know, more women, more fame. I, I, I don't know, more everything. I see. And I didn't want it. I mean, I didn't not want it. That's not what I'm trying to say. I don't mean I wanted to give it all up and go live in a cave like some old monk. But you did go and live in a cave. What? A 13-room cave. You're dead. And you're in hell. Didn't you know people could die before their deaths and go to hell? Well, I must say, I... No, I, I, I didn't know that. Oh, yes. Happens all the time. It's what religions are all about. All of them. And all philosophies and all faiths. They're all defenses against dying before your death and going to hell. Nowadays, some people call it depression and go to psychiatrists. 
Has it happened to you? Oh, of course. Or how could I know all about it? There's a way out, though. You, you can work your way back, though it's difficult. How? How? Tell me. Well, in everything you've said, something seems to be missing. Now, that, that part about your father's death, you told me you didn't feel anything. I think you felt a lot. Only it wasn't what you wanted to feel or, or thought you should feel. But I felt nothing. Well, you felt so much you couldn't sort it out and let it come clear. No matter what your father was to you at age 33, there was a time when your father was God. Strong, brilliant, kind and compassionate. Everything God is said to be. And then, little by little, he didn't seem to be God anymore. He became just a man with limitations. But I don't think you've ever forgiven him for changing into something else. How do you know all this, if it's true? Well... I know I've disappointed my own sons. And my father disappointed me. Excuse me, will you? Oh, certainly. I think I just saw something. And I had a black body streaking across the hill. I wanted to call to him. I wanted him to join me. I started to run after him. I was so desperate for his company. I ran and ran, trying to emulate his free and easy stride. And in the back of my throat, the word was forming. Something, something. And finally, I shouted it out loud. Something, something. Magically, he stopped. His ears pricked up. His head turned and his amber eyes fixed on me. I stopped too, and we looked at each other. Then slowly, he started toward me while I stood trembling a little and murmuring, something? He broke into a trot, and I said a little louder, something, something, come. And he lowered his head and started to run towards me. I felt tears start in my eyes, and a wash of feeling swept over me, a feeling that could only be hope, hope that I would find my way out of hell and back into life. You'll have noticed, perhaps, that at first, Anthony ran frantically after the dog something. Then, when their eyes had met, he stood stark still, and something began to run joyously to him. There's a moral to be drawn here, or a lesson to be learned. Not wishing to be didactic, I leave it up to you. I'll be back shortly. I believe I said at the very start that you were to hear a success story, didn't I? Or did I say simply that it would be a story about success? Well, no matter. Now that we've reached the end, it seems to me it was either the one or the other, and probably it was both. Our cast included William Redfield, Cork Benson, Joan Shea, and Dan Ocko. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Buick Motor Division and by the Florida Orange Growers. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. I hope you enjoyed this episode of CBS Radio Mystery Theater. If you enjoyed this and want to hear more, please subscribe to this channel.